title of this message is The Supernatural Christ. As we come to worship God, in Psalm 46 and verse 1 it reads as follows. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Let us now pray and ask God to bless us through our time of worship. Let us pray. Our Father at God in heaven, we pause now to praise you. We are told in your word that we are to be still and know that you are God. We bow our hearts before you. There are so many things that come into our minds. There are so many things that concern us. So many things, O oh Lord, that worry us and we think about them and meditate on them. But O oh Father, we pray that we'd learn to take everything to you. We pray that you would bless us and help us. We pray that you would watch over our hearts. We ask that we would praise you through the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that we would praise our blessed Saviour, the great Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray that we would have our worship through the Holy Spirit, the third person of your glorious self. He is God and we worship him, God the Holy Spirit, Father, Son and Spirit. We worship you, we praise you, we honour you. We bless you for Jesus Christ. We bless you for the cross of Calvary. We thank you that you sent your son to be saviour of the world. We bless your name. We praise you for Jesus Christ. How we bless you that Jesus Christ came to this world. We thank you, Father, for who he is. We thank you for what he achieved while here below. And especially when he died upon that tree at Calvary to bear our sin and shame. We worship Jesus. We praise the name of our sweet King Christ. We praise you that he is Lord. We bow and we worship Jesus Christ. We pray for your help and for your benediction and for your smile on our time together as we worship you. May we praise you. May we exalt you. May we glorify you and ever lift up our hearts to you and call upon your name. For you alone are worthy and you alone are great. We pray then for the forgiveness of our every sin through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us as we read the scriptures and as we think about your word. We pray that you would bless and own and anoint the preaching of the scriptures we beseech and come upon us we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Our Bible reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark chapter 6 verse 45 to the end of the chapter verse 56. Mark chapter 6 reading from verse 45 to the end of verse 56. Let's hear the word of God. Immediately he, that is Jesus, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. While he sent the multitude away, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. And he was alone on the land. Then he saw them standing, straining, a rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them, and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marvelled, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. 
when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognised him, ran through the whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch just the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Well, we've arrived up to looking at the planet Saturn. What do you know about the planet Saturn? Well, you may have seen pictures of Saturn and you've probably seen it with its rings around it. It's a very big planet. In fact, it's second to the planet Jupiter. We saw that Jupiter is the biggest planet and Saturn is just a little bit smaller. We said that if you compared Earth as a marble and compared Jupiter, that would be like a baseball in, in comparison, like a basketball in comparison. Now, if you compared Earth as a marble, Saturn would be like a football. So it's still very, very big in comparison to the Earth. The second biggest planet. Now, there was a man called Gallio, and in 1610, very long time ago, he got out his telescope, and telescopes weren't very powerful in those days, and he looked, and he only saw just the end of the rings, so he thought a bit like a cup holder, a bit like a handle on a cup, and he thought that Saturn just had cups, just like cup holders around it. Well, 45 years later, and they had a more powerful telescope, and they could be able to see that it has rings round it. You see, looks can be deceptive, can't they? When we look at something from a particular angle, they can be deceptive. Looks can be deceptive in us, can't they? You can put on a show, for example. But the interesting thing about Saturn is that on the face of it, it's very, very, very cold. Very cold. It's minus 300 degrees. You imagine, we get really frustrated, don't we? Really nippy when things are about 5 degrees and but imagine minus 300 degrees. We could never live there. There's big windstorms that are five times as great as the most powerful windstorms on Earth. Saturn. Very, very, very interesting planet. But in the center, it's very warm. It's 20,000 degrees centigrade. So very, very warm on the inside, very cold on the outside. Looks so deceptive, aren't they? And... It looks a very, very, very beautiful planet, doesn't it? You've seen pictures of Saturn, very beautiful. Ha! Huh. But, when you go to look at it closer, it's, it doesn't look very nice at all. And we can look at someone and think they're wonderful, but when you look at their lives a bit closer, we realise that every one of us is a sinner. We, we might look at a person generally and think they're good people, and they may be on the surface, but... In our hearts, we all have sin and we all need the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the one who wasn't impure. He was the one that was pure. And he is the one that can save us from our sins, can rescue us by what he did at the cross. So there's a few thoughts for us about Saturn. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made Saturn. We thank you that you know what you're doing, that you've not placed us on Saturn to live or have a holiday there. We thank you, Father, that you've placed us on Earth in conditions that we can live in. We couldn't live on Saturn. Father, we thank you that you know what you're doing and you knew what you were doing when you created the universe. And Father, we thank you for your many blessings toward us. We praise you, Father, for the fact that you're in control. We pray for churches in this area. We ask for your blessing on Jewsbury Evangelica. We pray, oh God, for church in Huddersfield. We pray that you would greatly bless them. We ask, oh Lord, that you'd be near to Brighouse and Halifax and Milnro and Haworth. We pray that you would watch over them and give them great help and great gospel blessings. Please be near them, Lord. 
May you encourage them in these difficult days as they seek to know what to do to open up. Give them wisdom in the future and blessing and help and watch over them in our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how we pray, Lord, that in days like these, that you will cause us to put our confidence in you. We thank you that you are our refuge and strength. You are a very present help in time of trouble. You're a gracious God and we praise you and we thank you and we honour you. We praise you for your mercies, O God, and we pray for those who labour for you in their various ministries. We pray especially for Andy McIntosh as he continues his creation work. We pray that you would be near to him. We bless you for him. And we ask, O oh God, that you would be near to him as he seeks to defend your word from the very first words. Watch over his ministry and bless it for good, we pray. And also, Father, we do pray for the preaching of the word of you now. We pray that you would attend it by the Holy Spirit. Give us grace. Oh, Father, we pray that you would watch over us. May your Holy Spirit come upon us and may you do us good. May we not go in our own strength and rely on ourselves. Lord, rid us of self-sufficiency, we pray, and give us the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. And it's for his name we pray.
Walking on Water. Our title is The Supernatural Christ. The Supernatural Christ. And what we're going to do is to look at the Lord Jesus Christ in this incident. To look at the wonderful Saviour. What's he doing in our section, in this event? Well, we have four things. Number one, praying. Number two, walking. Number three, calming. He calmed the disciples. And number four, joining. He joined the disciples in the boat. Four things about the supernatural Christ. First of all, then, notice, we see Jesus praying. What has Jesus, our Lord, just done? He's fed 5,000 men, plus women and children. How has he done it? He's done it from five small loaves and two small fish. And he's used that, something very small, and he's multiplied it and multiplied it and it has fed a vast amount of people. It's fed a great multitude, a great crowd. Now, it's already evening. The hours have worn away and the Lord Jesus sends the multitudes away. And we get the impression at the beginning of this event that Jesus is in a rush. He quickly sends the multitudes away. He makes his disciples get into the boat. And by the way, that word made there is very strong in the original. It means he compelled them. The authorised translates it as constrained. He constrained them to get into the boat. Maybe the disciples was resident, resident just to begin with. Maybe they didn't want to go into the boat. But the Lord Jesus made them get into the boat. He sends the disciples away in the boat. He dismisses the crowds. And is going to go up the mountain alone to pray. Now why all this quickness? Why all this suddenness? Why does Christ do this? After all, hasn't he spent all day with them? So why is there now this hive of activity to break up this meeting, to get his disciples away and to get up the mountain alone? Well, John's parallel account helps us out at this particular point. Now, this incident is recorded in three of the four Gospels. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark here, and it's also recorded in John. The feeding of the 5,000, as we said, is a very rare event. That's recorded in all four of the Gospels. But it's recorded in three of the Gospels, Jesus walking on the water. And John helps us out in his parallel account in John chapter 6. What do we read there? In verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they're about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now Jesus discerned, he perceived that this crowd who he's just fed looked at that miracle and drew the wrong conclusion. They thought that Jesus was some kind of an earthly king. And so they were going to take him by force and they were going to make him king. It's actually ironic, isn't it? Because in the feeding of the 5,000, in Luke's version, he says about the substance and content of Jesus' preaching. What was it? Jesus was preaching about the kingdom. And he would have explained and expressed how the gospel is a spiritual issue. He would have said about how his kingdom is spiritual. And it's ironic that at the end of the day, the crowds, before they're dispersed, want to take Jesus and make him a physical king. They didn't get the point, did they? They had a perfect sermon from the perfect saviour, and they didn't get the point. And it can be so often the case that people can hear very sound preaching and just not get the point. Oh, that we listen carefully and pray the Lord would speak to us so that we would get the point. 
And Jesus was having none of this. He didn't want to be made an earthly king. He didn't want all the applause and the congratulation. He wasn't going to stick around to have the limelight. He wasn't going to be wanting all of those things. He didn't want that in that sense, or the, the attention in that sense. He didn't want that. And so he's going to steal away, if you like. He's going to go away alone, dismissing the crowds. Things are getting a bit euphoric for the crowd. They're charged up. They've been hungry and now they're fed and, and they're emotionally drained, no doubt. And then they're taken up with this miracle. But they draw the wrong conclusion. Instead of saying, he's a spiritual saviour and I need this Lord Jesus. Who is he? He's supernatural. I need to trust him. They want to make him an earthly king. But the Lord Jesus is full of humility. He's full of graciousness. He doesn't want that. And how we must be like the master. How we must be humble and truly be humble. We shouldn't want the light, limelight. We shouldn't want the attention. We shouldn't want the applause of men. We should be wanting the Lord Jesus Christ to have the applause. We should be wanting to lift up the Lord Jesus. There's humility in our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we humble people? The Bible says we're to be clothed with humility. So Jesus goes away to pray. He wants to get alone with his heavenly father, which he did often. He would withdraw into the wilderness to pray. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed. He wanted to get alone, to have fellowship with his father. Maybe he was praying for the Father to strengthen him, particularly with the events now leading up to the cross. And with all that will happen before he gets to that point, perhaps he wants to recharge, as it were, of fellowship and communion with his Father. Now Jesus was no recluse. He had been with the crowds all day long. But now at evening, he wants to go away. He wants to go away from distractions. And when we come to pray, we need to be away from distractions. Away from those things that would come into our mind. Try and clear that, clear our minds, so that we can focus dedicatedly on the Lord Jesus Christ when we pray alone, just like the Master did with the Heavenly Father. He prays alone. He gets aside. Goes to a place that is deserted. Find a place where you can go to. Where there's no distractions. Some people have prayed in the woods before. They've gone into the woods where they can't be distracted. It's a good idea. Away from, afraid from technology perhaps. Away from distractions. To commune with their heavenly father. Maybe it's a room that you can go into in your house. and you Shut the door and pray. Notice there's a consistency between Jesus' teaching and Jesus' living. Because he said in the Sermon on the Mount, at the beginning of his public ministry, But you, when you pray, Matthew 6, 6, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Get alone to pray. That was Jesus' teaching. And what's Jesus' living? He's getting alone to pray by himself. There's no inconsistency, is there? Jesus teaches it and Jesus lives it. And how we need that, the consistent Lord Jesus Christ. The wonderful, consistent Lord Jesus. And how we're to get alone to pray before our God. Make time every day to pray and to seek the face of God. To be alone with the Lord in prayer. You won't regret it. It's a very good thing to do. Recently there was a video clip. The Heath Church in Wales at the moment are running a little series. And they're interviewing speakers. They're doing it over, over technology, over the internet. And so the preachers are there in their room. Or in their fun room or wherever it is. And there's a person who's... who's Speaking through video conferencing, and they ask 
This preaches several questions. The title of this series is Before They Leave the Stage. And there are different preachers that come on. People like Stuart Ollier and Alan McNabb and various different preachers. And one of them was Jeff Thomas. And they were, I saw a little bit of a clip of this, of this person interviewing Jeff Thomas. And they asked Jeff, they said, what would you do differently if you had your time again? What would you do differently? Been a minister for over 50 years there in Aberystwyth. He's retired as Jeff Thomas. And he was asked that question. And what he replied is, I won't attempt the Welsh accent, but what he had said is, you know, he said it's communion with God. He says that regular habit. Now I'm sure that Jeff's a man of prayer. But he said, I wish I prayed more. To have a habit of getting into prayer, of time with fellowship with God, of really praying to his heavenly Father. He said it should be like brushing your teeth. You, you do it. That's the time. Oh yeah, you brush your teeth. And then you brush your teeth. And how that should be with prayer. Yeah, that's our time. That's the time we spend with our heavenly Father. How there is an importance in our, pub, in our pub, private prayers to pray to God. Public prayer is important. The prayer meeting so vital. It's not either or, is it? It's and and both. And one feeds into the other. But at the moment we're emphasising here Jesus. He's going away and he's praying alone. There's a great book by a Puritan called Thomas Brooks. It's called Private Prayer, the Privy Key of Heaven. Oh, it's glorious. And he takes arguments about why we're to pray. It's a pray on words, isn't it? Privy key of heaven. It's the private key of heaven. It's the secret key of heaven. And it is. It unlocks things. There's private prayer. To get alone. To commune with our heavenly father. Just like Daniel. Three times a day. Communing with the heavenly Lord. How goes your prayer life? How goes it with you? In private prayer. Are you setting time aside. Every day. To commune. With our Heavenly Father. There's praying. Secondly. In this there's walking. Now evenings come. It was already getting late. When the disciples approached the Lord Jesus. About feeding the crowds. So it must be really late into the evening. The disciples have been sent away by boat. They're three or four miles. Into Lake Galilee. They're in the middle of the lake. And. They're having problems. There's often wind at Lake Galilee. As we had records to say when we looked at Jesus still in the storm. There's often winds and storms at Lake Galilee. They come up just by the end of the River Jordan. They funnel around the mountains and the wind whips up. And it's here. And they're straining at the rowing. They're straining at They're labouring. A.V. says they're toiling. They're toiling at rowing. And the Lord Jesus Christ sees them at the top of the mountain, toiling, they're straining a rowing. He can see it with his eyes, can the Lord Jesus. He sees their problems, and we have problems. Doesn't life feel as if you're, you're rowing against the wind? Doesn't it feel as if there's this trial and that trial and as soon as you get rid of one of them there's another trial that comes up and sometimes multiple trials come at the same time and there are problems and there are difficulties that come encroaching in upon our lives so often and we feel as if we're straining and we feel as if we're exhausted and, and the Lord Jesus saw the disciples in that state and friends the Lord Jesus sees our problems the Lord Jesus sees us in our difficulties. He sees us in our problems of life. He does see it. He saw it in the disciples. It's not that Christ is out of sight, out of mind. He sees us. And Jesus came to the disciples. Now he didn't come straight away. He waited until they were three or four miles inland when they're in the middle of the sea. And sometimes in Jesus' all-wise knowledge and in all things he's wise... He doesn't sometimes come when we want him to come straight away, does he? Sometimes the Lord Jesus may leave it a while. And then the Lord Jesus comes. And then he gives aid. He will come. 
but sometimes to help our faith, to aid us in our trust and confidence in God, we know that if there is going to be help in this trial, it's going to come from the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we just know that, don't we? And Christ, although he delays, he doesn't deny. He sees they're in problems and he goes to them. And how did he go? Wow, he walks upon the water. Supernatural. A few weeks ago we had a little holiday in, and we were in Broadstairs where I grew up. And Broadstairs is by the sea, it was a very warm time. So a few weeks ago when the sun was shining and we were in the beach. And, and the, my position in the beach was near the sea, right near the sea. That's where we sort of parked up and come, dumped up for a little bit during the, during the day. And so that these near the sea for our children to splash about in. And so we had this view near the sea and we saw lots of different people. And some people were splashing in the waves and some people were swimming. And, but I tell you something, I never saw anybody walking across the English Channel. I never saw it. Never saw anybody walking on the English Channel. Never. Because people don't. Have you ever tried walking on water? We can't, can we? We wouldn't even try. It's just supernaturally. It's just naturally impossible. It's got to be supernatural if someone does that. And here is Jesus. And he's walking on the wind and the waves. It's not calm. It's choppy. And he's walking on water in those conditions. Now why is he doing that? He's not just doing it just to show people that he can go by an alternative method of transport. And that he doesn't have to walk round. He can actually walk through the lake and get to his disciples direct. Just as Jesus didn't feed the crowd the, from the five loaves and two fish just to give them a free meal. He did. And it is a quick method of transport to go through the waves. But Jesus didn't do that for that reason. Is something more involved in there. There's something deeper here that's going on. Jesus is walking on the water. Why? To tell us who he is. To say, I am God. I am divine. That's me. I'm the Lord of glory. I can do as I please. Job, in praising God, in Job chapter 9, verse 8, talking about God himself, he says, He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He alone treads on the waves of the sea. It was he alone that spreads out the heavens. He's the creator, God alone. And he alone treads on the waves of the sea. It is God who treads, who, who, who puts his foot one foot in front of another on the sea. It shows us the true identity and authority of Jesus Christ. It tells us who Jesus Christ is. It tells us in unmistakable language and words that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is fully God. That's what it's telling us. He's the Lord of glory. And have we bowed to the authority, to what's been called the dominion of Jesus Christ? Have we bowed to his excellent greatness and said he is Lord? This man walks on water. See, it's so easy, isn't it, to look at these incidents and to say, yeah, we've read them before. Oh yeah, Jesus walking on water. Yeah, we've, we've read that. But think about it. It's Jesus walking on water. She should never be too familiar, familiar with it. That familiarity of the type that breeds contempt. This is stunning. He is the Lord of glory. Have we bowed to him as the Lord of glory? And it says that he would have passed by. Did you notice that phrase at the end of verse 8? That's a bit of a strange phrase, mightn't you? And would have passed them by. What does that mean? Well, I don't think it's just... A passing phrase. I think there's a little bit more significance to it than that. You remember in the Old Testament when God appeared incredibly to Moses. Now Moses represents the law. Now what did God do, the Lord do, in revealing himself to Moses? He passed by with his glory. 
And what did God do to Elijah? He represents the prophets when he was there. And Elijah was there in the cave. And the Lord came by and was in the still small voice. He passed by. You see, when God is exposing his glory and something of his magnificence and, and his magnitude, what's he doing? He passes by Moses and he passes by. By Elijah. And what's the Lord Jesus Christ doing here? And would have passed them by. He's revealing his glory. To the, he's revealed it to the Lord Moses. He reveals his glory through the prophets. Elijah. He reveals his glory to the apostles. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is showing the apostles who he is. He passes them by. Jesus revealing his glory. The great glory of his name. So we've seen praying. We've seen walking. Now thirdly, we notice that there is calming. Let's think about the disciples. Here they are. It's night. They've only got presumably the light of the moon upon them. There's no flashy torches, electrically powered, you know, battery powered torches. <laughs> there they are. They're on the boat and they're seeing this figure coming toward them. Now who wouldn't be scared? They couldn't see properly, could they? Because it was night. And here the Lord Jesus is walking toward them. And they don't know who it is. And they're scared. They're troubled. They're tossed by the waves. They're finding it hard enough to row. They've had an emotional day. They've had to serve this meal with the 12 baskets left over. One for each disciple. They've been tired. They've now got to row. They've rowed for three or four miles already. They're really exhausted. They're tired out. And they're seeing this figure coming toward them. They're troubled. They think it's a ghost. They cry out, it's a ghost. They're frightened. They're terrified. They're at their wit's end. Haven't you been there? No, you may not have been on a boat watching a man come toward you thinking it's a ghost. But you may have been troubled. Aren't we often troubled? Don't we often have trials? Aren't we often perplexed? Don't we often have difficulties in life? But isn't it interesting that the very thing that's going to cause the disciples' trouble is the very means of them being blessed. It's the master himself. And isn't it the case that the very thing that we fear and the very thing that we're worried about ends up proving to be a blessing? You remember that hymn by Cooper? You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The cloud you so much dread is big with mercy. And shall break with blessings on your head. Isn't it true? Yes, it is true, isn't it? That the Lord, he comes, the very thing that the disciples are fearing and they're fretful about and they're troubled about. The very thing is the means of their blessing. They're afraid and we often get afraid. We often get worried. We often panic. We're often stewing up. We're often... Like that. We're troubled. And Jesus knows that. But Jesus came to the disciples in their trouble. And friends, the Lord Jesus, he does that with his followers. When we cry out to the Lord, he comes in our trouble. Isn't this a picture of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? There God, the Father, is communing with God the Son. And there God the Son comes down from the heights, just as Jesus came down from the heights of this mountain in fellowship with the Father and comes down the mountain into the, the wind and the problems to rescue these disciples. And that is what he done. He came from the heights of having fellowship with his Father down to the wind of this world as it were, down to the problems of this world, to rub shoulders daily with sinners yet being without sin and coming on that rescue mission for sinners and dying in the sinner's place and rising again three days later to be our glorious saviour. Isn't this a picture of the wonderful gospel? Isn't this a picture of what the Lord Jesus will do? Come right into the middle of this storm to, to be a blessing to his people. And Jesus has come right into the middle of the problems. 
in dying upon the cross and in saving us from our sins, in shedding his blood at Calvary's cross. What does it say? Verse 50. But immediately, the Mark's favourite word, he uses it twice at least in this passage, immediately he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Doesn't the Lord Jesus Christ speak to us? Doesn't the Lord Jesus Christ speak to us in our problems? Doesn't the Lord Jesus Christ say to us, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Doesn't Christ speak to us and say, be of good cheer, be of good courage? We can be of good courage when Jesus speaks to us in the midst of our problems and troubles. He says, it is I, it's me, it's the master, it's not ghost, it's me, it's the master. And the I there is very emphatic in the original. It's one of the same wording as the I am statements, the ego I me sayings, the I am. I am sayings of Christ. It's very emphatic. Because there is grounds for these disciples not to fear. And there are grounds and reasons for you and for me not to fear. Be of good cheer. It is I. It is I. I am. It's emphatic. It's like exactly the same wording as the I am statements. And Jesus has this great I am statements in John. Isn't there? I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. When we come to Jesus, he, he satisfies us. He's our bread of life. That's why we don't need to be afraid. It is I. It is the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He's our light that leads us. That's why we don't need to be afraid. When we come to Christ, he said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, which is why we don't have to be afraid because of Calvary. Because the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life for sinful people like us and rose again. He's the good shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. We don't have to be afraid of death, our final nemesis, do we? Because Jesus is our resurrection and life. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I am the vine, I'm the true vine. It is him. It's him. Have we bowed to him? We don't need to be afraid because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have we confidence in Christ? Do we look to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have confidence in Jesus? Because he whispers peace. That him, when peace like a river, thou shalt whisper peace in my soul. One of the verses ends. Pray. Jesus prays. Let's pray. We can't perform miracles like the Lord Jesus. We're not God like the Lord Jesus. We worship him. We can't walk on water like the Lord Jesus. But we can pray like the Lord Jesus. And we're being like the Lord Jesus when we pray. Praying. Walking. Supernatural Christ. Walking. There he is calming. Calming his disciples. It is I. Do not be afraid. Then lastly, join in verses 51 and 52. After reassuring his disciples, Jesus comes, jumps in the boat with them. And what happens when Jesus jumps in the boat? The winds cease. And when Christ comes with his presence, isn't it sweet when we know the presence of Jesus Christ being close? Isn't it glorious when Jesus comes alongside us? He's so sweet and glorious and reassuring when we have his presence near us, especially in trials and problems. Our oh, friends, if you're not in Christ, you're missing out, aren't you, from the presence of Jesus coming alongside us and us having fellowship with Christ and Christ fellowshipping with us. And he comes into us and dines with us and he with us. If you put Christ on the outside and he's knocking at the door to come and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice 
and come into him. Hear my voice, open to the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Christ being near in his sweet, glorious fellowship with the Lord Jesus. He is glorious. And the wind ceased. Another miracle. He walks on water and, he, and the wind ceased as soon as he gets into the boat. This is two miracles. And Christ's presence is so glorious, isn't it? Now the winds might not necessarily cease in our lives the moment Jesus comes. Because otherwise, if you're not careful, we could end up giving the health and wealth approach that as long as We've got Jesus nearby, we're not going to have any problems. Oh no, it's not quite like that. We can have Jesus' presence near in the midst of our problems. But the, you get the point, don't you, about the sweetness of the presence of Jesus Christ. And what's the reaction of the disciples when Jesus comes into the boat? The wind cease. Verse 51b. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvelled. They, it's the top of the scale in amazement, isn't it? They were not just amazed, they were greatly amazed. They're not just greatly amazed, they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure. And not just greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, but they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvelled. You see how he scales it up? Does Mark. He's truly amazed, amazed by being amazed, they're absolutely amazed, top of the scale, super, super amazed at Jesus Christ. Oh, may we be like that hymn that says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how on earth he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How could he do it? It's amazing. We need to be amazed by Jesus Christ. Stunned by Jesus Christ, ponder anew at what the Almighty can do. He's glorious. He is really glorious. We're stunned by Jesus Christ. We have to take time with Jesus Christ because he's glorious. He's stunning. He's one that walks on water, that calms the, the, the wind when he steps into the boat near his disciples. He's great. But you see, the disciples, they didn't understand about the loaves, we're told in verse 52, because their heart was hardened. They didn't get it. When they served out the bread and the fish, and then one per disciple had to pick up the, the baskets, wow, they didn't get the point. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God. They didn't get it. Didn't compute. Hang on a minute. Christ is doing something a bit more than just feeding the crowds. Their heart was hardened. They were like rock. Is your heart hardened to Jesus? Can we look at these events and just go, let's have a soft heart. This is Jesus, incredible Christ. Have soft hearts absorbing the Lord Jesus Christ, being greatly amazed in ourselves beyond much and marvel. Let's not be those who do not understand, do not comprehend. Let's be those who understand the lows and understand the walking on water. And let's not make sure our hearts are hard. Now they did get it, the point in the walking on the water. Because in Matthew chapter 14, what are we told here? Verse 33. Then those who were in the boat, the disciples came and worshipped him saying, truly you are the son of God. They may not have got the point in the feeding of the 5,000. But they've got the point here in this particular incident about Jesus walking on water and the wind stilling when he gets in the boat. Have you got the point about Jesus? We need to labour it and we labour it when we look at the Gospels. The beginning of Jesus, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Has that Gospel begun in you? Have you come to know Jesus, the crucified, risen Christ? He's no ordinary man. He's our Lord. And say, oh, that you've come to. He's more lovely, isn't he? When he comes over on the other side at Gennesaret. And all the people are like, Jesus is there. And they go all the way around the surrounding villages. And they come with their sick. And he helps them as many as touch the hem of Christ's garment. They were made well. Oh, friends. May we truly love the Lord Jesus Christ. May we come to him and know him. And believe in him. And have him always as the supernatural Lord Jesus 
cross. Whatever amazing stunts we've seen. I'm sure that you're going to be looking at least a little bit, aren't you, at the Olympics in Tokyo, which hopefully is going to go ahead. And I'm sure there's going to be some amazing things. You know, when you look at some of it, the way they, they can get their body over poles and the way they can just tune their body in with their diet and exercise and everything else and run that fast. And we're just amazed by it, aren't we? We're stunned by these people, these athletes. Oh, but Jesus, he can walk on water. He can do the supernatural. Oh, that we would trust in Christ, love the Lord Jesus, and be filled with him. This is the supernatural Christ.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his great, stunning works. We really pray that we would love the Lord Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Help us, Lord, to be filled and thrilled with Jesus. We pray that we would trust our Saviour. Bless this word to our hearts. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.